Hey everyone, this is Dr. Calkins. Uh, today we're going to be doing experiment 12. Experiment 12 is you are what you eat and we eat lots of things that are made of protein, carbohydrates, DNA, and lipids. These are our four major categories. The ones that are in our book are proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. The one that's not in our book because they're not actually a polymer is lipids, but we did add them to the notes, which unfortunately adds them to the homework, uh, any quizzes, and eventually the exam. And check the notes for those you're not going to find them in our book so i'm going to give you a quick rundown basically read through this this is a great summary uh, of the different groups so we're going to run through these quickly and then we're going to get to the fun part which is the lab part coming up so what's nice about proteins is they make up most of your body so there's 20 different amino acids they contain both a carboxylic acid and an amine functional group so pay attention to these for the last page of questions because most of the answers will be found here. Remember that carboxylic acids and amines do make polyamides, and that's where that amide functional group comes from. Although biology does call it a peptide, which is what we want to call it in the exam and homeworks. Single amino acids are called monopeptides. Remember proteins and peptides both start with the letter P. Great way to remember who's who. Two amino acids, you change that uh, prefix to dye. If you have more than two, we would call that a polypeptide, but again, proteins and peptides both start with the letter P, easy way to keep those straight. Ten amino acids can build the human body, but in order to have a healthy human body, we need all 20, 10 of which are essential, so that means we have to get them in our diet, so make sure you get a diverse diet in order to get those that are missing. And again, our human body is made up of structural proteins like our hair, skin, and muscle, but they also have functional proteins called enzymes. And it's kind of ironic that protein-based enzymes, some of those are designed to break apart other proteins through a hydrolysis kind of process, which uh, requires water. So remember this is a condensation polymer, so when an amine and an acid get together, they kick out water to make an amide. So in order to digest these, we need to take proteins drink lots of water, and with the help of enzymes, which is other functional proteins, we can break those back into smaller units. Let's flip over and look at our next group. Here we have carbohydrates. Carbohydrates is just a fancy name for sugars. And almost all the sugars that we deal with are glucose-based. What's unique about sugars is they contain aldehyde and ketones. It's oftentimes called aldose and ketose sugars. The alcohol functional groups is what makes them so water loving and so water soluble because they can bond through hydrogen bonding. If you take an aldehyde or a ketone and you react with one of those alcohols, you'll get what looks like an ether. It's actually an acetal, but that's not a group we cover in our course. To us, it looks like an ether because it looks like a sugar, oxygen sugar. So it has a sugar on ether side is what we would say. Simple sugars are called monosaccharides. So again, where P and P came together for proteins and peptides, we have sugars and saccharides, both start with the same letter S. In most situations, we're going to need to call them by their original name of carbohydrates. But just know that carbohydrates are sugars and sugars are monosaccharides. The simple sugars are glucose, fructose, and galactose. The only one that we really deal with is glucose. Sometimes you can put two sugars together and when that happens, you get a disaccharide, the most common version is sucrose. This is our wife's table sugar. You can also make lactose, which is uh, famous in milk. Remember those OSE endings are very common for sugars, but also remember from our protein previous section, those ASE endings would be enzymes. So again, if somebody is lactose intolerant, they probably lack the lactase enzyme needed to break that sugar into monosaccharide units. Maltose and uh, grain sugars. And again, those are two glucose versus glucose and lactose, or the one that we commonly digest would be glucose and fructose. But again, two sugars, so dye, sugars, or saccharides both start with the same letter S. As we look at polysaccharides, polysaccharides are polymers of sugars, typically glucose. Starch and cellulose in plants are great examples of those, and glycogen, all three of which are in the homework. The human body needs carbohydrates for energy. So when you give a kid a pixie stick, they go crazy. But what's unique about sugars is most sugars like sucrose, they would take two years to digest without the help of enzymes. So unless you're gonna wait two years to go to the bathroom, 
sugar wouldn't really give you any benefit without the help of those protein-based enzymes that come in as soon as you uh, have saliva come out from underneath your tongue. That's our first introduction of enzymes to help break down our food as soon as it enters our body. Glycogen, again, animal starts, that's a polymer of glucose. And lastly, very similar to proteins, carbohydrates need water to break apart. They're also condensation polymers. So when sugars are made with plants, they need lots of water because as they, uh, and they also form lots of water because carbohydrates, as two sugars come together, just like in these, the aldehyde and the alcohol together will kick out water. So if you're kicking out water in that condensation polymer process, we're gonna to need to drink lots of water with the help of enzymes to reverse that process, break them apart into simple glucose units so our body can take advantage of that energy. Another section that we talk a lot about is nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are DNA and RNA, DNA being the most important one. A lot of issues with DNA and the coronavirus right now uh, coming from a bat or wherever. So DNA can be in viruses, those just have a protein shell. But nucleic acids are kind of ironic in their name because they don't have an acid functional group, they actually have amines and they do have amides too. They do have sugar, so they do have the alcohol functional group that carbohydrates have, which is unfortunate because now they overlap with the previous group. So be careful when you're answering questions because some of these groups are used more than once. But because these sugars are in their cyclic form, you're never gonna see the aldehyde or the ketone that you would see in a carbohydrate. The phosphate linkage is an inorganic linkage. It's the phosphate PO4, negative three, P43 ion that we saw before. When we think about DNA, the letters DNA, specifically the D, stands for the deoxyribose sugar. Deoxy just means it's missing an oxygen, so in this case, it's missing an alcohol from its uh, former replicated version, RNA with ribose sugar. DNA contains four main bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Those are the A's, T's, C's, and G's. What's unique about the A's and T's is they hydrogen bond twice, and C's and G's hydrogen bond three times. So you'll never find an A with a C or a G or a T with a C or a G. Only A's and T's bind, only C's and G's bind. If there's a mismatch, it's a mutation and that can lead to things like cancer and so forth. Uh, RNA contains most of the same, although the uracil is replacing thymine of DNA. DNA is our polymer for our genetic code, so all of our traits from our parents are usually expressed in some fashion, whether it's height or weight or color of hair, or freckles or whatnot. So you do get half and half, so you should look like your parents in some fashion, look like your siblings in some fashion. Uh, RNA again is the replicated version, and you learn about that in biology class. What we're mostly worried about in chemistry is its structure. And then lastly, the thing that's uh, in the news all over, and the reason I'm making all of these videos, uh, hopefully within this week and next week, is because of viruses. Viruses have foreign DNA encapsulated by proteins. And the problem with a virus is it has proteins. That's the perfect camouflage to enter our body. As soon as we smell pizza, our body produces saliva, so we're drooling just like a dog. We just don't allow it to leak out our mouth like a dog. And as soon as we smell that food, our body starts producing these enzymes and they want protein. So when you breathe in a virus, they see that protein and they think, hey, there's some candy-like molecules that I would love to have. So those enzymes start tearing apart into the uh, protein coating, that shell starts dissolving and out comes DNA from something else, whether it's a bird, a bat, uh, a pig, so any kind of bird flus or swine flus or whatever. This is the process that gets our body into trouble. Oftentimes DNA is recognized and our uh, immune system can destroy it. But sometimes DNA does what it does best and replicates, and if it replicates faster than our body can deal with it, we start to show a lot of symptoms. And without some help from, say, a vaccine, maybe those symptoms won't go away, and um, that's an issue. So some viruses last forever. Hopefully not this one. One last group to talk about, and then we'll get to the fun part. Lipids, the only group that is not in our book, they are large molecules, they're just not polymers. Most of them have glycerol, which is an alcohol, and they have fatty acid chains that are typically saturated or unsaturated. So because they have glycerol, that O-L ending says alcohol, 
fatty acids are carboxylic acids. And they group together much like we saw with our polyesters, they form esters. It's just that when they only form three esters, as in most lipids, they would form a triglyceride. Uniqueness of a fat, oil, and a wax. A fat is solid. It's very greasy, so sometimes semi-solid. And the reason that it's a solid is because those saturated bonds of the fatty acid stack, just like Velcro, very difficult to peel apart. So a common fat, again, is the triglyceride. Those are gonna have saturated fatty acids, so remember those saturated bonds are all single bonds. Oils, different only because they're liquids. If they're liquids, it's because they're no longer saturated, they're unsaturated, and when that happens, you typically come from a plant, so a vegetable oil, for example. So the only major difference between a fat and an oil is the chain type of that fatty acid in those two situations. If you like chocolate, you're not gonna like this one. Waxes, very similar, but only have one ester. They have a long chain alcohol and a fatty acid. So they lack three fatty acids, the triglyceride oils and fats have. They have a long chain alcohol instead of the glycerols that these have. Again, fats from animals, oils from uh, plants, but now waxes like candles, you may not think of chewing on a candle, but they oftentimes add wax to chocolate to keep it in its form. So you can stamp that Hershey idea with it. A lot of steroids and hormones are also lipid-based. Steroids like testosterone and uh, estrogen uh, and so forth. So when you see these steroid hormones, again, think ketone, O and E ending. But if you give a uh, certain hormone to a certain gender, you can actually reverse those traits, and those are um, unique to that lipid kind of category. The fat-soluble vitamins are the A's, D's, E's, and K's. This would be all dogs eat kibble, for a cute way to remember that. So if they're fat-soluble, that means they're water insoluble. So these oftentimes, when you take these as supplements, they're going to have a hard time dissolving in the body because they like fat, not all the water floating around. Vitamins B's and C's are missing, so those are the water-soluble vitamins. Uh, not lipid based. The reason our body needs fat creates cell membranes in the form of phospholipids. You learn about that in anatomy, physiology kinds of classes as well as biology. It's also our long-term uh, long energy storage. So when you see a lot of those survivor shows, they're going to chew up their carbs quick. But as they start starving, they're going to use and take advantage of that fat to give them energy until they have none left. They're also used for those chemical messaging molecules that we call hormones. Lastly, much like all the others, lipids are hydrolyzed by water also. So if lipids are hydrolyzed by water, we need to drink lots of water because now we're adding a molecule of water that doesn't like lipids because it's nonpolar and water's polar. So more than proteins and carbohydrates, lots of water is important for lipids because they're just not very soluble. So our body has a difficult time breaking down lipids for that reason. It's a body full of polar molecules. These are nonpolar. They're going to find fat cells in your body. They're going to stick there on your face cheeks and your butt cheeks, and they're going to stay there for a very long time. The only way to get these soluble is to heat them up. And how do you think you can heat your body up? Well, hopefully not through a fever, but through exercise. And with the help of proteins called enzymes, can they start to slowly be broken down? The liver does a good job at help breaking them down through bile salts. And again, these are not polymers. They're not in your textbook. But they are a group that we're going to test here in a few minutes. So as we look at all of our tests that we're about to perform, we have a biuret test for protein. It's going to have a blue solution, but turn violet if protein is present. Negative is obviously going to stay blue. Benedict is a simple sugar test. It's going to change a variety of colors. And the more colors it changes means the more simple sugar it has. So carbohydrate test, it's a monosaccharide test. Obviously, it stays blue if it doesn't work. Dugal's is an iodine test. So iodine turns uh, from a kind of reddish brown solution to a very, very dark blue or black if starch is present, which is a polysaccharide. And then lastly, uh, stays brown if nothing happens, if there's no starch present. Diphenylamine is a DNA test. Obviously, you can use black lights, things like that you see on TV. This is a clear solution. It'll turn dark blue almost black if there's DNA present in living organisms like plants and animals. Obviously, it stays clear. Um, if there's no DNA present. And lastly, we have a fat-soluble dye, so only with 
oily, greasy things, will this dye ever produce its red color? If it stays in that black pepper looking form, that's no oily nonpolar substance present. So our job in this lab is to test these various substances and then also test an unknown through a CSI-like investigation. So we're going to take a break and get lab set up and we'll be right back. All right, so we're actually gonna skip back to page 82. The entire premise of this lab is with a story. A patient stumbled into a hospital holding his stomach and fell to the floor unconscious and has food poisoning. His pocket contained three receipts from three restaurants. Our job is to test his stomach contents, which is our unknown. It's not gonna be one of our other samples, but we're gonna put all of our data for our unknown in this position here. And then vertically, we're gonna see if it matches a restaurant. So if it's chicken pizza, it's gonna be positive for protein for the chicken, uh, negative for simple sugars. It's gonna have starch in the crust, so positive there. Chicken again for DNA, chicken again for the fat around the chicken. So really, we're just looking for that negative and a lot of positives. If it's typhoon, we're looking for a bunch of negatives, but only one positive for the starches in those um, noodles. And then lastly, for chicken wings, just about all positives, but now we have a negative for starch, positives for everybody else. So we're really paying attention to either this positive and a lot of negatives, or some negatives in those positions to know who's who. And then eventually we're going to figure out where we ate so we could contact those kinds of restaurants. So we're going to jump back to the protein test. And as we think about the protein test, we're going to need eight test tubes. Um, we're going to need each one of these food items. We're going to take a minute to prepare that for you. And uh, we'll be back in a minute. All right. All right. So poof, we have everything set up uh, just like we need in the order that we need. So we started out with our corn syrup. We have our chicken stock. We have our egg whites, safflower oil, whole milk. We have our potato juice and then our unknown. So again, our unknown is not one of these previous uh, samples. We're just getting an uh, idea of what some of those tests are going to look like with different colored solutions. So the issue that we have as we look at some of our testing solutions over here, if we start with blue, sometimes that's difficult because some of these already have a previous color. So if they have a previous color, that's going to make it a little bit tougher to identify. But again, what's most important is our unknown. And let's take a few minutes to at our 20 drops to each of these tubes. There's three tests that require test tubes. So we're gonna go ahead and fill all of those now to save some time. All right, so we have our control water. So we added that tube to make sure that we know what a negative test looks like without any other alterations. That's our, our last uh, data point anyway. So take a minute to look through these food items and give your prediction on whether or not it has protein because the Bayerette test will find it if there is. So take a minute to do that now. So all right, so as we look at our tubes, we have our uh, diluted syrup, we have our chicken stock, our egg white, our safflower oil, our milk, our potato juice, our unknown, and then our water. So the directions say next to add 10 drops of the Bayerette solution. So we're gonna bring it over. Bayerette is just a blue solution. And we're gonna add 10 drops, or in my case, maybe just a little squirt, and then see if we can get any color changes. So again, we're looking for proteins, so something that has some amino acids. And remember, positive test will be blue, so, uh, or at least it's going to start blue, but then it should turn violet if proteins are present. A negative will stay blue, and notice that's what it's doing over here for our water. So here's a negative. Slowly look across and see which ones show any sign of purple. Keep in mind, not all are going to be exact because not all have a clear starting solution. So again, one more time, here's syrup, here's chicken stock, here's egg white, safflower oil, notice it's separate. Um, here we have milk, potato juice, 
are unknown and distilled water. So the most important thing is notice the unknown staying mostly blue. So record those now. All right, so based on our final colors, you should know positive or negative by now. Obviously the distilled water is a negative. Definitely the unknown is what we worried about most and it was also a negative. So as we move down, Benedict's test is gonna look about the same, at least in the beginning, because it is a blue solution, very similar to Biorette's. So again, we already have our tubes with our 20 drops. We're gonna add an equal amount of Benedict's and take this time now to give your prediction of the simple sugar while we uh, add some solution. All right, so here's our Benedict solution. So we're gonna add an equal volume of Benedict's to each one. And unfortunately, this one doesn't have an immediate change like the other one. So we're gonna have to boil it for five or more minutes to see if we can get any of those color changes. So Benedict's is a blue solution. So obviously a negative is going to stay blue. We went ahead and labeled these so that we could put all of these in at the same time and not worry about them getting mixed up. But remember, Benedict's test for simple sugars like monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose. So we're gonna make and hope some of these turn from blue to a green, a yellow, an orange, a red. The more colors they turn, the more sugars that are present. So we're gonna take these to the hot plate and then we'll be back in a few minutes. So we have our water boiling. We're gonna go ahead and add our syrup. And then our chicken stock. Our egg whites. Our safflower oil. Our milk. Potato juice. Our unknown, which is most important of all. And then our definite negative of water. So as we watch these over the next few minutes, we're going to look for some color changes and we'll come back when they start to turn. So notice we have our first color change. The first one to change is high fructose corn syrup. Notice its color change is very dramatic, very quick. So keep an eye on that too. We'll look to see if any others are starting to change. That one's definitely changing first. Everybody else just hanging out. So notice now it's getting closer even to uh, a red color. So a tremendous amount of sugar, simple sugar there. Nothing else really doing much yet. So we're gonna come back in a few minutes and give you the results. All right, so here's uh, about five minutes. We're going to get some test tube clamps and bring them out, put them in the test tube rack and look at the results. All right, so now we're looking for this final color. Remember, anything other than blue is pretty much a test, but keep in mind some of those solutions were already not blue. So it's not gonna be perfect, but definitely our water should be. So let's take a look at uh, syrup, definitely super dark. It had the most color change. Chicken stock did have a little change maybe, but it was already kind of a orangish color, so that's a tough call. Egg white looks pretty gross because we boiled it. Um, so look at that one, record your observations. Safflower oil, again water, tree solution sank to the bottom based on density. Here milk kind of curdled, that's pretty gross, but again, recognize some of those color changes that we see, definitely not blue anymore. Here we have our potato juice, got a little bit of color change there. Our unknown looks like blue again, so definitely the most important one, stay blue, so there's another negative. And then again, water, our best negative. So one more glance at these, record these observations, um, decide positive or negative, and we'll move on to our next test. All right, on our next test, we're looking for starch. Starch is a polysaccharide. So what we're gonna do is take three drops of each of our samples from uh, before, and then add three drops of our testing solution, which is Lugol's iodine KI solution. And then what we're looking for is that reddish brown solution that we drop out of the bottle should turn dark blue or black for a positive test. Otherwise, it's going to remain brown. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a couple drops of each. So here's our corn syrup. Here's our chicken stock.
Here's your egg white. Here's our safflower oil. This one's very thick. It takes a little bit longer to get some. Our milk. Our potato juice. Our unknown, which is the most important in our situation. And lastly, a little shot of water. And then now time for our testing solution. Kind of decolorize the label. So a couple drops of each one. So again, starting with corn syrup. Um, again, before I do this, let's go ahead and give your starch prediction um, so that we don't cheat and give you the answer. So go ahead and fill that out now. All right, once that's done here, we can see if you know what has starch and what doesn't. So here's our corn syrup. Again, this kind of color here is just straight out of the bottle, so no change yet. Next we have our chicken stock. Next we have our egg whites. Next we have our safflower oil. So far, nothing too inspiring. Here's our milk. Here's our potato juice. And here's our unknown. And here's our water. All right, so definitely found some useful information here. We have lots of just KI solutions. This one's not very soluble, so it stayed in its little uh, droplet form. But all of these, except for these two, this being our potato juice, and this being our unknown, showed a positive test. So take your time now to finish recording your observations and decide positives or negatives, and we'll move on to the next test. All right, so our next test is our DNA test, and this uses diphenylamine. So again, our 20 drops, but again, we planned ahead and made three rows of those already, so those are ready to go. We're gonna add our uh, 40 drops in step three of our solution. It's a clear solution. And as we add it, notice nothing's really gonna change uh, much. What you're missing out in this particular one is we're using sulfuric acid and acetic acid in their concentrated forms. So if you've ever smelled vinegar, this is vinegar on steroids, but it also has some battery acid mixed in. So notice nothing too much happening yet. This one needs a little bit of motivation, so we're going to boil this one for about 15 minutes and then come back. But again, no changes with the initial addition and definitely no changes with water. So this is a perfect time to go ahead and give your DNA prediction because we didn't give you any answers yet. So predict which has DNA. Just remember DNA is in living things and you can do that now. All right, we're back at our hot plate. We're gonna add all three, or in this case, all of these tubes to the boiling water but then we're gonna come back in 15 minutes and see the results. All right, again, you should have had your prediction. Now we're gonna look for uh, final colors. So again, it started out clear, but it should turn a dark blue, almost black color if DNA is present, and that would typically be in living things. So let's take a look at our results. We have syrup, uh, perfectly clear. Chicken stock, very dark. That's a good test. Egg whites. Just kind of boiled the eggs. Safflower oil looks like it's starting to change. It does come from a plant, so there could be traces amounts of DNA potentially in that one. Whole milk does come from a cow, but it is pasteurized, so that kills the DNA, so we're not seeing that. Uh, potato juice, very dark, so it did come from a plant. And then our unknown, which is most important of all, no change, uh, just like water. 
So one more time we'll pan through them, but record your final colors. And we'll come back in a minute. All right, last test, and then we can plug in our results and check it out, and then we have a few questions left. So in the Sudan dye, this is a nonpolar dye. So it's going to like nonpolar molecules, which is perfect for lipids. So as you look at all of our examples, think which ones have fats, oils, and waxes, and I'll let you do that now. All right, next we're going to be looking at these samples. In this case, we're going to change our directions a little bit. Uh, what works a little bit better is to take a large piece of filter paper and we're going to shake our dye directly on our sample. So in order for that to happen, we're going to fold it in half, fold it in quarters, make what looks like a pizza with eighths, and this will help us organize our sample as we draw circles and label them. I'll do that and we'll be right back. All right, so we have our paper labeled up. We're gonna add a couple drops of each one. So here's our corn syrup. Here's our chicken stock. Here's our egg white. You may have thought earlier that egg white should have shown a DNA test positive, but remember the DNA is in the yolk, not the white. And this is also pasteurized, just like milk. Here's the oil. Here's our milk. Potato juice. Unknown. And a little shot gently of water. I'm going to bring over our Sudan dye. So this is a red dye, but it only activates color when there's nonpolar lipids like fats, oils, and waxes. So we're going to give it a little shake on each one, starting with corn syrup, chicken stock, egg white, Safflower oil, milk, potato juice, unknown, most important, and then a little bit on water. So it takes a little bit to dissolve, so we're going to come back in a few minutes and see if we can find any red. All right, last test results. So again, you should have a prediction of what happened, and now we're going to see what actually happened. Our corn syrup stayed black, chicken stock stayed black, egg white stayed black, but no positive test. And we have some milk, and we have some potato juice, we have some unknown, and we have some water. So really our only test to worry about is the top one. All right, so now we're gonna go to each one of our pages and find our positives and negatives for our unknown, and you can do that now. Looking at your positives and negatives, look vertically to see which restaurant matches up. And write it below. All right, so the major functional groups, that was pretty much the first paragraph of each of our previous sections that we covered at the beginning. So check those out for the answers there. These are definitely test questions. The linkages also listed at the end of those paragraphs. Check out those, those are also test questions. As we look at some examples here, remember there's clues. Things that have ASE are different than things that have OSE, so pay attention to those last couple letters. That can give away those two. Anytime we have any kind of virus, there's gonna be two answers for it. And then again, those hormones like testosterone, they do are, they are ketone based, but which of these choices would we give it? Lastly, lipids are insoluble in water and we wanna know why. What makes lipids so special that they do not like water? And that finishes this lab.